territory. With that, my dear friends, let me invite everybody to move forward. And with that, we are flipping the page to another subject for discussion. And please welcome our next speaker to discuss the problem of hospital-acquired infections in surgical hospital settings during the war. So please welcome our next speaker, anesthesiologist, deputy chief physician of the Athenia Clinical Hospital, uh, PhD in medicine, associate professor at the Department for Anesthesiology of the National Medical Academy of Postgraduate Education of named Dr. Shubchik, um, Dr. Andriy Strokhan. Thank you so much, and warmest greetings, my dear colleagues. This would be my honor to be uh, addressing you from this stage, uh, and uh, particularly here in the presence of our international friends. And the title which you can see in the slide is one of the top priorities, and I'm sincerely convinced in the relevance of this uh, subject because the current situation, including clinical situation we observe in Ukraine, is different from the rest of the world, given the scale, the gravity and complexity uh, of this armed conflict, which is actually the war we are part of. Uh, speaking of disclaimer, I don't have any conflict of interest, but please look at this fresco dated back to the 12th century. Uh, because it's quite um, demonstrative of the situations that we observe currently in Ukraine. And with that, uh, going to the uh, uh, picture when the bullet is extracted on uh, from the uh, beating heart of one of the Ukrainian servicemen, I believe this, you are familiar with this picture, which was taken on the third week of the war. But looking at this chart, uh, let us try and see what is the relationship between bacteria and the war in terms of dynamics. Uh, this spike is the time when Ukrainian troops were withdrawn from the Baltimore. At that time, uh, the, we didn't have such big-scale warfare, but our hospital admitted 170 patients uh, over the matter of five days. And looking at the prevalence of uh, Pseudomon Aeroginose and its impactor balmony, which back in those days we thought would be our major headache and the challenge, but the situation changed dramatically soon after. And again, these were all uh, servicemen admitted to our hospital. And speaking of the relevance of such problem, <clears throat> here's a publication by the World Health Organization, emphasizing that particularly when it comes to inpatient care, we have almost 25% infected immunosocomial infections in the inpatient settings. M many of them might be admitted to intensive care units, and the prevalence of mortalities induced by such sepsis in ICU settings is quite high, despite all the modern care solutions available. Uh, Florence Nightingale, the first description of infections in wounded and why this results in their lethality are despite intensive care efforts. And this has been described ages ago. We remember the publications by Pirogov, then by Nightingale, and now we can see the face of our major enemy. And <laughs> Uh, looking into this list, this is mm, uh, can be transliterated into escape, which is the most common uh, group of pathogens globally. But in Ukrainian case scenario, that would be a cap, K A P with Klebsiella, Acinetobacter, and Pseudomonas, respectively. If you perform a culture uh, testing of your patient, you will see these top three favorites at the top of the list. In Ukraine, everything was quite uh, challenging even before the war started. Here you can see the data as of 2019, and resistance to carbapenems was 61%. And Klebsiella 61, Cinderbacter, uh, respectively high enough. But now, converting that into a pie chart and other graphs. Wait a second, these buttons are malfunctioning or disobeying my clicks. 
So again, here, unfortunately, we are sharing the same geographical space with our e northeastern neighbor, and the situation with Klepsiela is comparatively uh, better, but speaking of the rest of the pathogens, this is still alarming. Uh, thank you, dear uh, Dr. Homanuk. With your assistance, we uh, have managed to break this ice in order to enable civilian hospitals to accept our uh, servicemen. And here you can see some of the statistics of 23 examined patients which have presented at a time to our anesthesiology and ICU department. But interestingly enough, in three patients only, there was zero cultures, while most of them had three, four, and even a greater number of cultures. And looking at the results of our cultural studies, this would be the group of enterobacteria, which uh, should be dominated by E. coli, but in our case, that was Klebsiella pneumonia. And I'm sure this would be a similar case scenario in any ICU department in the civilian sector which is dealing with the servicemen. But also look at the blood. A gram-negative flora is also getting their numbers high. And again, this is cumulative for 2022 and 2023, but situation is developing in the dynamic manager. Central catheter in complications. That's another phenomenon we are discussing with uh, military medical units in order to make sure that the stable patients do not should not have the central venous catheter installed. But majority of the patients coming following such catheterization, they come already infected with Klepsiella um, pneumonia, Atentobacter and um, the P element as well. And that is something to remember of what and how should be done at the stabilization point. Yes, you are saving the life, but the central catheters the resulting in the uh, catheter site infections and prevalence of resistance strains. Um, looking at, at this chart, we also can see that namely grime negatives are dominating in the statistics, and that would be similar in any other uh, inpatient uh, care facility. So the situation we're observing at the moment is resistant to three strains of Klebsiella, different subtypes of Klebsiella, all of them um, being susceptible to different extent, but in most cases this is multi-drug resistant. So um, we have to use in uh, customized solutions in terms of antimicrobials to select. And this is due to the multi-stage evacuation uh, and referral uh, system when the patient can travel to uh, different hospitals. So I do remember a patient case when uh, such uh, wounded servicemen has traveled between four different hospitals within two days, within 48 hours, being administered with different antibiotics on that pathway. And again, now in the context of WARM, the efficacy of coordination in such referrals he can be compromised. And again, the KAP is in the dominating priority list. But why is it so? Um, and well, we understand that everybody tries to make everything possible and beyond that in order to save the life of our wounded servicemen. But that results in the problem primarily being triggered by administrative and financial reasons as well as lack of communication and coordination, which results in high infection rates with nosocomial infections. On the one hand, <clears throat> and the problem with the antimicrobials as well. In some cases, you have to use whatever you have available. And due planning, procurement, and supply of antibiotics uh, can also be challenged or even disrupted because of logistical issues. And that, to some extent, is also serving as an explanation to our current status quo. So this combination of administrative, financial, clinical, 
um, factors are resulting in such um, disadvantaged situation when we have major difficulties, thus triggering additional problems to the future management of such patients. And again, sometimes you don't need a miracle to happen in order to improve the situation, because sometimes the appropriate referral of the patient and appropriate management of the patient in different stages can be can become a, a helpful solution. Let us take a look at the medical evacuation pathway from the American sources, which is impossible to implement it in Ukraine, because uh, we uh, have to deal with a mean aggressor who is targeting civilians, who is targeting uh, medics, and that is where and why our medical evacuation in Ukraine is impossible. Full stop. Only when it's the safer neighborhood, Dnipro, Zaporizhia, question mark again, even in Dnipro, this could be challenging. <clears throat> and thus we understand there are collecting centers where the uh, injured servicemen are collected for future referral, and then only they are dispatched to safer neighborhood. Thank you, dear Constantine, for sharing this chart. And here we can see obviously now that it's the second and uh, secondary and tertiary level when you um, uh, have the greater number of patients uh, which require additional referrals. But at the same time, remembering the timeliness uh, is also a factor. Um, there are cases when our patients, which uh, cannot be transported because of the lack of vehicles, uh, medical evacuation vehicles, helicopters, these are primary targets for the aggressor, and that is also um, a factor to take into consideration. For example, I do remember recently we had a patient who spent four full days in the battlefield because there was not a single evacuation vehicle available in the neighborhood. And this is just a one of the extreme examples. But even if it were three days instead of four, that would also make this case extreme. So with that, let us look at the major problems we have to deal with. First of all, these would be the wounds, contaminated and infected, depression additionally to that, and other mental health and emotional disorders, pain to manage. And in this slide, you can see one of the typical pictures in our uh, settings, and again, tourniquets, particularly inappropriate use of them, and long evacuation time, which results in the prevalence as high as 70% uh, of our patients with such complicated and multiple traumas requiring hemodialysis, but you know, sepsis on top of that, cardiovascular arrest, and looking at the SOHF ratings, the survival rate for such patients is very low, but we are managing to save their lives. Uh, uh, it's extremely large, the problem with, the, with the, our uh, treatment of the patient, and uh, my personal thought that uh, concerning the infection control from the point of view of audience and the point of view of authority, what should happen with the uh, with this uh, patient. Uh, the first one, the uh, healthcare uh, ministry and the local uh, administration of the hospital, and third, the uh, adequate antibiotic therapy in order to prevent uh, a normal situation with antibiotics because we are under the country in the, in the whole world that has uh, that, uh, faced uh, such a huge problem. And it's impossible to, uh, uh, to see that uh, any company will produce a new antibiotic for us. According to the uh, healthcare ministry, this uh, they worked very well, and because they published two great uh, report and two great uh, order, but the main problem was still uh, exist is the financial, uh, because it's impossible to implement it uh, without any financial appropriate information. And uh, from the point of view of local hospital, we can provide a lot of orders and, and a lot of uh, authority, uh, but uh, from the technical point of view, it's really challenging. Uh, and uh, look at uh, World Health Organization. Uh, we should isolate it, uh, the uh, patient with the nosocomial infection. But uh, if we uh, see the real situation, we can observe that uh, half our patients are infected. Uh, but uh, 
but uh, Soviet system of buildings, uh, we have a, at least two patients uh, in one uh, ward, uh, but it's sometimes it's given uh, four and even more. But so from this point of view, it's almost impossible uh, to isolate infected patient. Uh, so. Uh, Another problem is the lack of personality. Uh, another another kind of uh, problem is his uh, personal hygiene, uh, hand hygiene, and sometimes we forget about that uh, because uh, uh, it's obvious that uh, medical personnel is one of the main factor uh, who provide uh, this nosocomial infection, and especially the uh, local surgeons. And we have to understand that uh, surgical nurse, this is the one who uh, uh, wash the hand properly, but not the surgeon themselves. So what is the main uh, uh, measures? So uh, carbon uh, resistant bacteria, acetobacterium, uh, pneumomerginosis, uh, isolation of the patient. <coughs> And moreover, uh, we've got a lot of uh, isolating uh, guns for uh, after COVID, uh, but according to our uh, personal experience, we can say that we uh, put all the uh, human aid because there is no one who want to take it. Uh, but uh, but we have to understand that any personnel who uh, hold contact with the with the patient in ICU uh, should have a special gown and should be isolated uh, from the another one problem. Uh, this is a uh, transfer of the patient, uh, so this is the main problem uh, that uh, everyone have to uh, want to say that it's my patient and uh, you should uh, transfer it. And uh, a lot of patients who are <coughs> delivered of, of the, uh, our clinics. Uh, single usage instrumentary is uh, another problem. And uh, I have to say that we have an experience in Mayo Clinic, um, and we can uh, we can say that uh, every patient uh, over there has a special uh, single-use uh, cough uh, for autonometry. <laughs> and uh, every patient has his own, uh, but in our, and our reality. Uh, there is impossible to see the situation, so the the same cough for the, for all the patient, and uh, we can uh, understand that this is require a lot of uh, payment and the financing. Uh, so the, and, uh, another another question is prioritization. Uh, so uh, isolation, uh, preventing measures, uh, and and we have to save antibiotics. Uh, because we have situation absolutely uh, in, uh, because acolomycin uh, uh, is a baseline uh, treatment for our patient. So and what we have in the further, so there are a lot of uh, microorganisms. They are uh, naturally have their resistance for these uh, antibiotics, and that is why when our stationary. Uh, 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 because uh, uh, and we reveal a lot of uh, a lot of microflora that are totally resistant. So the first group if, uh, who is uh, um, uh, less productive for carbon fiber. And what should we do? And we have to uh, uh, to switch on piperacillin and tazobactam. Uh, and if you have a, a MRSI. And uh, we can use Miropanem, and if we better like Tamas, uh, see, and we have to save Carbapenem and base your therapy on Etopenem, and uh, after then to switch on Etopenem. And uh, if if you uh, uh, if you have the uh, microflora that uh, totally resist Carbapenem, uh, so. And you have to switch on skin of usage that itself and uh, the uh, in order to to uh, to uh, for the usage take it clean uh, as a reserve of antibiotics because we will f we will further have the situation uh, uh, no antibiotics therapy at all that we could use uh, to treat the patient so uh, so uh, what good uh, have we absorbed uh, during this week uh, the, first of all the, the problem our main problem is catastrophic 
uh, could have one and out of our personnel because they are totally one out, they're totally exhausted. This is a real catastrophe for, uh, for them. They are totally exhausted. The next problem is a lack of uh, uh, medical personnel, and uh, this is impossible to absorb prioritization because there is impossible to uh, to get to earn uh, a real money uh, in medicine right now. Uh, because and to really challenge and to motivate personnel uh, without uh, additional uh, additional uh, earning and additional payment. And we have a lot of uh, patriotism under these circumstances, especially medical nurses uh, and uh, even there. And the next question is a psychological burden uh, of this uh, patient. Uh, because uh, <clears throat> so we should also be mindful of the emotional and psychological tension because these additional burn out and burn out effects and syndromes are aggravated <clears throat> and then the lack of space and appropriate space management in the clinics and impossibility to isolate the patients with nosocomial infections because they have to be placed into isolated rooms they need specially designated medical staff and what is the solution here surprisingly enough there was an idea suggested by my colleague from new york who's managing a private clinic who said that in other outpatient care unit which is performing uh, prosthetic care services again private clinic outpatient care prosthetic services uh, they have only 0 0.05 as the level of nosocomial infections and uh, they are managing to sustain such low prevalence of um, antimicrobial uh, burden because three is the maximum allowable looking at those numbers my eyes are opening wide but at the moment we don't have any solutions available because our inpatient care facilities within the um, uh, uh, entire healthcare system they have no right to perform any outpatient inter uh, surgical interventions because of the regulatory uh, limitations but again speaking of that clinic where they have 330 patient bed capacity with 75 of them for icu which means you need at least 25 percent of your patient bed capacity share reserved for intensive care and anesthesiology and now let us look at our job descriptions and the flowcharts of our clinical performance but again there are some successes uh, uh, one of them is reduction of this so-called frontline uh, duration by one sometimes even two days and and also the number of intermediary hospitals involved in medical evacuation is also going down the fact uh, that some of the civilian hospitals have changed their profile of their functioning and providing assistance to the military medical sector is also an advantage particularly in the areas where they don't have any baseline knowledge um, they are acquiring such knowledge and skills intensively via additional uh, training of their staff and acquiring uh, the best available modern techniques but if we could benefit from assistance from our american and european partners to strengthen the capacity of the entire system um, uh, that would be uh, quite important because without such assistance provided regularly throughout these um, periods we would not have survived and even now we rely from 30 to 40 percent on the humanitarian support coming in terms of medicines consumables and uh, medical equipment as well so we truly and sincerely appreciate all of the support that you are generously sharing with us well, with that driving towards conclusions and findings and recommendations first and foremost the system has to be transformed we understand that any reform and transformation in the wartime is an extra burden and challenge but that is something to be done further on despite the war and this is my personal and professional opinion we have to build new hospitals with new design of the facility 
authority with a new school of health professionals uh, being involved as this for staffing because half reforms and half transformation some cosmetic changes they won't be effective so sometimes we have to build such clinical centers starting with a scratch and here's a reference to one of the articles to an american publication <coughs> whose also where authors are also sharing their view and findings and the well as solutions to improve the current situation with the clinical care but also importantly enough the flow of humanitarian assistance and supplies uh, should also be transformed because this is not the matter of sharing with us whatever is the leftover in your stocks sitting at the warehouse or something with expiry days due this assistance should be targeted targeted to specific needs of particular facilities particular as services particular regions because in most cases looking at the inventory list of the humanitarian supplies we see the same old uh, style supplies which we've been shipped for years but sometimes we have gaps in what we actually need so here appropriate communication planning and coordination would also be helpful Thank you so much, Nadia Andre. This was really eye-opening in some respect. And uh, I can see the hand raised for a question. Yes, let us enjoy this moment in time where we have just yes, two minutes. 20 seconds, if I may. Thank you. And thank you, first of all, for your job, for your presentation, and for our productive collaboration. We do appreciate that. My question is about the synergy of antibiotics. Do you conduct any research on that using uh, antibiotic combinations? Are there, is there any progress or is it in decay? As a matter of fact, we do. Our microbiological laboratory is trying to work hard as well as the reference laboratory in Kyiv. So the synergy in antimicrobials use um, is under study, but and that is supported by our cultural investigations. And unfortunately, when we have the app Absolutely. Mm. Uh, as you know, some strains which are resistant to everything, then synergism is the only solution. I do understand there is lack of evidence. We also appreciate this. Now, this um, challenge is not so burdensome elsewhere in the world, particularly in Europe, uh, and we have to be inventive and creative enough. Sometimes we manage to help our patients. These are exceptional cases. A lot depends also on the uh, wound care performed by the surgeons. Additionally to the antimicrobial intervention, um, but uh, again, uh, these are exceptional cases and we have indeed to generate the new evidence uh, with that in mind uh, let me invite you to join our efforts in this respect because again we're also trying to be creative but this is a challenge for everyone excellent uh, this is a wonderful start of potentially promising collaboration that we have become witnesses of and if there are no questions then please be invited to continue communicating over the coffee break and with that we are moving to another